Good evening and Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to you and your family. No matter where you're watching from around Alaska tonight, thank you for watching Alaska Weather and trusting us with your weather information to keep you and your family and your community safe over the holiday season. It's my pleasure to serve you any way I possibly can. And if you have any questions about what you're watching tonight, uh, where you can find the images, or if uh, you need some more information that you can't find on our websites, on our Alaska Weather Information phone line, 1-800-472-0391, always a free call in Alaska, uh, let me know. I'm happy to help you find what you need so you can make safe decisions and keep on doing what you need to do no matter what part of Alaska you're watching from tonight. My email is right here, david.snyder at noaa.gov. I'm on the rest of the week and I will be here to help guide you through the weather as we see it as we go into the weekend. Let's take a look at the weather tonight. Uh, we'll start off with our hazardous weather as we always do. Red is bad, yellow is not quite as bad, but still bad, and orange is getting ready for bad. We don't have any orange on the map right now, but we do have plenty of red. Red is uh, warning level stuff across southeast, and primarily that consists of wind and snow. Uh, the greatest risk for snow tonight is generally around the Haines area and up the Klondike Highway. We have blizzard warnings in effect there. Uh, that'll go through 9 o'clock on Thursday morning. And generally, we're talking about blizzard conditions above about 1,000 feet on the highway. And that could bring us anywhere from 6 to 18 inches of snow and gusts to 45 miles per hour there around the Klondike Highway and above Haines. We're not expecting a tremendous amount of snow or blizzard conditions in Haines. So great news if you're in Haines. It should not be a significant issue for you. Uh, just below uh, the Klondike Highway area to about uh, 1,000 feet again, we're expecting to see uh, that kind of weather. But below that, the condition should rapidly improve. In fact, it sounded like even at the customs uh, office there, uh, the border, it was still raining there earlier this afternoon. So it's going to be a really close call between goes all the way over to snow and wind to, eh, it's close, but it's still raining. You know how it goes in Haines. You've been there before. This is one of those situations. Uh, many areas, though, that you see in southeast that are painted in red are for high winds. Those gusts there could reach upwards of about uh, 60, 65 miles per hour, and that could bring some of that wind into the Juneau region as we go through tonight. So prepare for a strong wind through this evening. High wind warnings are posted from Cape Weather and Cape, Cape Fairweather and Cape Suckling all the way around, hit and miss around the Juneau area, around the outer coast, around southern parts of southeast. And we're also talking about some uh, accumulating snow up around Hyder as well. Hyder has the potential of seeing anywhere from 9 to 15 inches of snow in the Misty Fjords region as we go through tonight and into tomorrow. So southeast, a lot of active weather, mainly because there's a big old low sitting right there in the Gulf of Alaska. You'll see that on the satellite picture here in just a minute. In the meantime, out across south central, winter weather advisors are posted there. Those regions shaded in yellow. Uh, mainly due to some blowing snow that's still reducing visibility across the uh, Nikiski area. And it uh, looks like uh, that'll probably continue. About two to four inches of additional snow is still possible. So it's not really the heavy amount of snow that's coming your way. It's mainly the blowing snow that's reducing visibility is why we want you to know about that. And that's true, too, for Resurrection Pass areas if you're driving up and down uh, the Sterling Highway or up into the Seward Highway regions. Uh, as you look northward, uh, we're talking about uh, winds and wind chills for the eastern Alaska range in the upper Tanana and Tanana Valley regions there. Uh, wind chill values could drop anywhere from 40 to 45 below in the next 24 to 36 hours in that region. So more on that in just a minute. Let's talk about the winds real quick again in southeast. Uh, a little more uh, specificity here, easy for me to say. Uh, for the highest winds, Yakutat, Elfin Cove, Pelican, from 6 o'clock tonight until about midnight, your high winds will be at their greatest peak. Skagway through about 9 o'clock tonight. Juneau, Sitka, Prince of Wales Island, anywhere from 6 p.m. to about 3 a.m. on Thursday. And then Ketchikan, looking at some stronger winds from about 9 o'clock tonight until 6 a.m. on Thursday. Again, some of those winds could reach up above 55 to 65 miles per hour. So a little bit more clarification on that for you. Uh, we're also talking about additional snow in south central. And uh, mainly the western Anchorage area could see uh, maybe up to a half inch tonight. Flurries and then about another one to three on Thursday. The Matanuska Valley perhaps as much as one to three. Copper River Basin could see another uh, four to six inches of snow. Tops, that's probably on the higher side there. In the Kenai Peninsula, like I said, anywhere from two to maybe uh, five or six inches of snow through midday Thursday. So it doesn't sound like we're really going to have any significant issues for uh, heavier snowfall. Uh, the one exception to that would be the Copper River Basin there. Uh, perhaps uh, looking at some uh, kind of towing the line uh, for a winter weather advisory. So if you get a snow alert for that reason, that'll you'll understand that. As we look, oh, let me go back one here. As we look back across the eastern Brooks Range, 
and into the upper Kobuk and Noatak valleys, as well as the central and eastern Beaufort Sea coast. We're talking about wind chill warnings there. So red level wind chill warning stuff because uh, our wind chill values could drop to uh, anywhere from 60 to 65 below in the next 24 to 36 hours. So this is kind of stay put mode for really cold kind of weather there. Many locations are already looking at nighttime temperatures tonight on the thermometer, not the wind chill, but the thermometer going below that kind of magic 25 to 30 below level where it's seriously cold. So again, be extra careful there. Everything you see here across the Chukchi coast into the lower Kobuk and Noatak, uh, into uh, northern parts of the Seward Peninsula, the interior, and into southwest, those are all wind chill advisories. Uh, where we could be pushing up to about 45 below for what it feels like outside. The actual thermometer temperature probably considerably higher. Here's a look at the satellite picture. On this Christmas Day, you can see a broad area of low pressure moving quickly into the Gulf. Strong south and southeasterly winds wrapping into southeastern Alaska tonight, blowing a lot of moisture through south central the Copper River Valley and dragging in a tremendous amount of cold air behind that. Uh, that moving air on top of the already frigid temperatures will drive that feels like index, that wind chill value, down into the 45 to 65 below level for the eastern Beaufort, uh, parts of the upper uh, Kobuk and Noatak valleys, and even into parts of southwestern Alaska uh, with at least the beginning stages of that big cold, so about 35 to 40 below perhaps in parts of southwest. As you can see behind that, uh, just a lot of northerly winds coming into the Bering Sea. Uh, a lot of what we're seeing here is rapid ice growth through the uh, Bering Strait. So good news is it looks like that's closing off. So finally, and out across the west, low pressure quickly working into the western Aleutians. You can see the beginning stages of that front creeping into the western end of the chain with high pressure already just uh, about to St. Paul and St. George. 1,014 millibars there, 1,009 millibars on the north slope, and then a, a pretty decent area of low pressure across the Gulf at 970 millibars. The triple point is where we're finding uh, the cold air, the warm air, and the occlusion all wrapping up together. This is creating a, a heavier round of precipitation moving into the northern Gulf, and it's also squeezing a lot of air through here. So again, we have those high winds coming up in southeast tonight. On the north and western side of this is where we have the colder winds and enough cold for snow to continue across the Kenai Peninsula. As we get into tonight, uh, the low pressure system work, works northward. We constrict that wind across the Alaska Range, across south central and the Copper River Valley. It's going to be fairly blustery right across the northern Gulf coast. So again, out there right along the coast, we're going to see that very fast moving ribbon of air kind of uh, crank up for about uh, 12 to 18 hours. And folks around southeast and the outer coast are really going to get that strongest burst of wind uh, quickly. And then that should subside all of a sudden. You'll see periods of rain and snow in southeast. Hyder again looking at 9 to 15 inches with a winter storm warning. Haines, blizzard conditions possible, especially above 1,000 feet. Down in Haines again, we're not expecting that. But uh, high winds across southeast uh, by and large, including areas around Juneau tonight. So flights in and out could be a little tricky. Uh, snow showers around the Alaska Peninsula and then out to the west, another uh, decent storm setting up at 969 millibars. And that uh, reminds me, storm force winds also out at sea along the coast there. So watch for storm warnings there if you're heading out. High pressure across the um, uh, north slope there, 1,018 millibars, areas of ice fog likely with that. And we're going to see some blowing snow, it looks like, across the Beaufort Sea Coast as we get into Thursday. So with a lot of air moving through here, and especially with the amount of cold pushing southward, uh, watch for the winds to come up across the Copper River Valley. Watch for low pressure to hover closer to the northern coast. That'll keep that pressure gradient up. And across southeast, rain and snow will be possible, but the worst of the wind looks to be tonight. A few snow showers around the uh, Bering Strait region, St. Lawrence Island down to the Priblobs. Nothing too significant there. Just the cold really is the big factor. 962 low out across the central and western chain on Thursday by Friday. That's moving east. Another wave works into the Gulf. Stronger southeasterly winds uh, start up again for southeast. And then we can see that deep cold pushing southward. Some of the coldest weather we've seen so far this season moving back into south central and continues for the interior, the north slope, and the west. So again, uh, temperatures bitterly cold for this time of the year. Here's a quick taste of what we're looking at for Thursday morning. 30s in southeast, teens and 20s south central. The interior anywhere from 35 to 50 below in some cases. 30s uh, below zero across the north slope. Southwest, 25 to 30 below. Highs on Thursday, not much recovery there at all. And now, aviation weather around Alaska.
for the day after Christmas. As you get things going again on Thursday morning, we're going to start out the day with widespread IFR across the north and eastern Gulf Coast, spreading through the Kenai Peninsula, Prince William Sound, and all the way through the upper end of the Tanana and the Yukon Valleys. Most of the Yukon Valley itself should be VFR. Most of southwest should be okay as far as visibility and ceilings go. IFR concerns will linger around St. Lawrence Island and coming out of the Bering Strait and also across the western Aleutians with MVFR preceding that and also working through the Alaska Peninsula into Kodiak Island. Most areas north of the Brooks Range summits will see MVFR and a few places may see hit and miss IFR, but the coastal locations generally north and east of Wainwright all the way past Utkiavik and eastward Prudhoe Bay and Dead Horse will likely see VFR conditions, but east of that, you'll start to run into marginal weather once again. That's going to shift around a little bit as a trough of low pressure is passing through. We'll see IFR sinking southward into the Chukchi coast there with hit and miss IFR across some of the summits. IFR lingers around St. Lawrence Island, also across the western end of the chain, and we'll continue to see IFR holding over southeast and a large part of the Alcan border pushing westward toward Tanita Pass all the way up into the interior, maybe sneaking its way into Fairbanks, and then south central uh, and westward, uh, generally VFR throughout your afternoon. Friday morning, hit and miss IFR across the north slope. Marginal conditions even further south than that, but south of that, we see VFR all the way through Norton Sound, Kotzebue Sound, southwest, most of the middle Yukon Valley, and through the Kenai Peninsula and Kodiak Island. Hit and miss IFR continues across the Bering Strait down towards St. Paul and St. George, looking for IFR just south of the Schumigan Islands and south of Kodiak Island once again, and along the higher train for southeast, looking for marginal conditions across the north and eastern Gulf Coast, but notable improvements over what we started out with for your day on Thursday. For Friday afternoon, IFR returns to southeast. You'll see some marginal holes in there, generally south and around Petersburg, but uh, looks like mostly IFR conditions for southeast. Marginal conditions all over the Gulf, Prince William Sound, Kenai Peninsula into Cook Inlet, generally north of uh, Kenai and Soldatna, though you'll start to see some breaks into VFR and then most of the interior southwest, Norton Sound, all looking to hold at VFR levels. IFR around Kodiak Island and up the west coast and into the Bering Strait and a wide swath of the North Slope looking at IFR with coastal locations, though, holding at marginal conditions. Here's your past conditions for details on Thursday. Then Anaktuvik and Adigan Pass, we expect to hold at marginal levels. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass cold, but VFR, Rainy Pass leaning over to VFR conditions as we go. Windy Pass expected to be MVFR. Isabel Pass, we like to say IFR for your daytime on Thursday. Ventasta Pass probably pushes back to IFR as we get into the day. Tanita Pass looking like instrument flight rule most of Thursday. Portage Pass starts there, but then should see a little bit of improvement as we get through the day. And then IFR concerns are expected around Chilkoot and White Pass through most of your Thursday and maybe into early Friday morning. Freezing levels show a lot of cold air is dropping southward across the Alaska Peninsula and all the way through the Bering Strait. The surface freezing line snaking well south of the Shumigans and Kodiak Island back into Prince William Sound and then holding over the higher terrain over southeast with a little bit of warmth coming up the eastern part of the Gulf anywhere from two to 4,000 foot levels showing there. Icing potential will be decreasing across the region because the amount of cold air is substantial as driving southward. So while there is moisture there, it's not going to be at the levels or at the temperature that would be conducive to widespread, isolated, moderate icing or worse at this point. Out across the central and western chain, below 8,000 and above 2,000, you can run into a little bit of isolated moderate and also across the southern end of the Alcan border into parts of Prince William Sound, the north and eastern Gulf Coast, below about 9,000 to above 4,000, and that will generally hold for most of southeast to Prince William Sound, which is just typically below 8,000 feet there. For your Thursday. Looking at the jet stream, we can see high pressure is in control of uh, the southern half of the Gulf of Alaska with a trough across the west coast and a pronounced trough leaning east and south into the North Pacific. You can see that driving force coming in around 150 knots, but we have a lot of cold air dropping southward, and that's working with this uh, fast moving river of air right here across southwestern Alaska, moving into the northern Gulf around 70 to 110 knots. A complicated pattern, but one that will keep us very busy for the next several days. Northerly winds driving in across the west coast 20 to 25 look for lighter winds to the east westerlies moving across the gulf 50 to 55 and southwesterlies banking into southeast alaska high pressure out across the western bering sea keeping that cold moving in down the west coast to 3,000 feet a trough of low pressure works out of western canada and into south central again those northerly winds coming in around 30 to 40 knots across south central and generally 10 to 20 across the interior turbulence will be watching out across the chain below 4,000 feet for some isolated severe most of southwest kodiak island 
sun generally west of Cook Inlet below 4,000 feet in parts of southeast looking at turbulence. Welcome to another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service and joining us today two more people to talk about the augmented reality sandbox. It's Alana Velaji. She's a University of Alaska Fairbanks mechanical engineering student, helped design and work on the details to make this new type of sandbox there. Thanks for joining us, Alana. <laughs> and Courtney Brees, she's the outreach coordinator for EPSCOR, which is the experimental program to stimulate competitive research. It's a, a program funded nationally by the National Science Foundation, right? Yes. Okay. Alana, tell us about how you changed and adapted this version of the augmented reality sandbox. It's a really cool tool. So, Gina approached us with three goals for this new version of the sandbox. Mm -hmm. They wanted it to be compact mm -hmm. in a light system that could travel around the state. Mm -hmm. They wanted it to be child oriented. Okay. So, we designed the sandbox to have three different levels. Okay. It's pretty cool. You can yeah. have younger children, you can have high school kids. Uh -huh. um, I guess I should say high school teenagers. Sure. <laughs> And then we also designed it to be more marketable, user-friendly, so that this could be seen eventually in classrooms all over the place, all over the state. Okay. And you had a big hand in this, but this was a team approach, right? Definitely. It was a really good experience for myself, for George Stevens, who we'll see later. One of our hand models today. Yeah. For um, two other members who aren't here today, Cody Klingman and Austin Hunt. Uh -huh. And um, it was just a really good learning experience all around. Very good. And this is something that is part of your learning experience as well. So you get to check a box in your education. Right? Yeah, it's a requirement for um, seniors of mechanical engineering at uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks. Very good. Very good. Well, it is a, is a wonderfully uh, inquisitive tool, fun to play with, and I hope to get my hands in the sand here in just a little bit. But it's also part of a bigger program, something that we were talking about a moment ago, EPSCOR. And that's what Courtney is here uh, to tell us more about. What is EPSCOR and why do you need a sandbox? Well, EPSCOR, as you mentioned, is a national uh, program. Mm -hmm. We're funded nationally, but we're actually located statewide. We're at UAF, we're mm -hmm. at UAA, we're in Southeast at UAS. And she mentioned, you know, taking the sandbox as an educational tool. And that's where our, I'm an outreach coordinator for the South Central Test Case. Okay. Our focus is on the Kenai watershed. Mm -hmm. And we are really interested in using these tools like the sandbox to interact with the students down there and get them interested in STEM and also communicate the research findings that we've been having throughout the state. Okay. And one of those, as uh, George and Eric are kind of changing the contours for us there from UAF to uh, maybe something that <laughs> resembles a little bit of something uh, more of the Kenai watershed, which is one of your focuses for the study, right? And, and specifically looking at some of the changes there and how that impacts people and also the salmon. Yes, it is a, all of our research is social mm -hmm. and environmental. Okay. So we have social scientists working hand in hand with our environmental scientists. One of the things we're studying is Upper Russian Lake, mm -hmm. and we have a researcher taking sediment cores from that lake. So one of the things we're going to use the sandbox to communicate is how the landscape changed over a long period of time, thousands of years, going from glacier, covered by glacier ice, mm -hmm. to being filled with water. And, then and that's what they're doing right now, exactly. So live. They're, <laughs> exactly. That's so they're so moving cool. the water around. And then I think they've got some props over there because we're also going to go a little bit more in depth and explain how the salmon got there. Okay. So using there's these... there's the salmon. Exactly. <laughs> oh, I think there's a few more. <laughs> yeah, we so. like more salmon in Alaska. More salmon. Yeah, exactly. So it's really taking the findings from our research grant and just trying to connect with the community and translate it in a really hands-on and mm -hmm. exciting way so people can you know, interact with us as much as possible. Well, sure. That, that makes the learning and the science real and, and quite literally in your face rather than just some boring black and white paper that you have to read about. This is something that people can understand better because it's visual and they're touching and feeling and seeing these changes, right? Yeah, and get them engaged. And then mm -hmm. outreach is a huge component and working with the younger students and actually even, I mean, working with the UAF graduate mm -hmm. and uh, engineering students is it's a huge part of our grant and our we really enjoy it. Oh, it is wonderfully exciting. And so, Alana, you were telling us that this is built to travel. Right. And this is built to do more things in version one. Where can this type of project go in Alaska? And what can it demonstrate? I mean, we were hoping to eventually get to villages that were harder to reach. Mm -hmm. um, 
that you couldn't necessarily move a whole fixed instrument to, right? right. You need something that can pack up, fit in your truck bed. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of the, the most attractive parts of this project is that this was going to be something that was used past our, our graduation point. You know, this okay. is going to be something that lives in the state for years. Right. Right. Well, it looks like you're well on your way with that. So what are, uh, give me another example. What else can this show us? We've talked about the, the Kenai River watershed. What's the coolest thing that you've played in the sand with? What, what's your idea? Well, I definitely enjoy the props, but we also like kind of building up a giant mound. And uh, if you put some water behind it, you can make a, a little uh, runway, I guess, and, okay. you know, demonstrate the effects of the hydrology by just letting kind of putting up a dam and letting it all pour right down okay. and so that could I think you mentioned it earlier you could even demonstrate the effects of a tsunami right or okay. something along those lines so it's not just topography but it's also hydrology yes. and coastal surge mapping and some of the coastal changes that we're seeing here in Alaska and seeing what the smaller changes in the sandbox might do to kind of a real effect of a slosh or a push of water up on the coast mm -hmm. uh, tsunami inundation mapping or even glacial dam release as, as some uh, has been demonstrated before. Yep. So, oh, wow, that's you know that's just an impressive thing. That it seems like the possibilities are nearly endless with this, and probably even more ideas that are popping up in your head too. Yeah, as we speak. <laughs> Very cool. All right. Well, if folks want to get more information about EPSCOR, uh, you guys are online. You're on Facebook, Twitter, and on YouTube. Uh, a K E P S C O R, right? EPSCOR, uh, Alaska EPSCOR, that is. Mm -hmm. And again, you guys are funded by the National Science Foundation, yes, so more to come from that and a, and a longer term study there. Thank you, ladies, uh, for joining us today. Uh, congratulations on your hard work there. This is really fun. And uh, for now, mm -hmm. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder uh, with this edition of Alaska Weather Facts, and I'm going to go play in the sandbox there. We'll see you next time. And now, marine weather around Alaska. And back with a look at your sea ice update. Now you'll notice the Chukchi Sea is filling in there, if not closed off at the Bering Strait. We still have a significant area of open water north of Sabunga and Gamble, north of St. Lawrence Island, south of that, of course, as well, all the way down to St. Matthew, and north and west of Macoriak here. But Norton Sound is filled in, the Bering Strait is filled in, and we still have marginal ice north of St. Lawrence Island. That will continue to improve as we go into the next couple days, especially with substantial cold pouring south and west. Uh, also some newer ice there inside of Bristol Bay and of course across northern parts of Cook Inlet north of the Forelands. More information anytime for you at weather.gov slash anchorage slash ice. Here's a look at southeast. We know it's going to be windy. High wind warnings are posted for many of the coastal areas all the way up toward Yakutat tonight and through the evening and early morning hours in some cases. We have winter storm warnings for Hyder there with a the strong south wind pushing moisture up into the misty fjords region and also up into Canes where a blizzard warning is in effect above Haines by about a thousand feet or so, so not in Haines specifically. But it will be gusty there in the Lynn Canal. Gusts of 45 knots are expected from the south. Six-foot seas there all the way down through the inside passage with 10-foot seas in the Clarence Strait region. And onshore flow just blasting Yakutat all the way down to Craig with 24-foot seas and southwesterly steady at 35 knots. Storm force winds are expected across the coastal areas tonight. And as we get into Friday, you can see that improves a little bit. But the wind turns more from the south and east parallel to the coast with winds 40 to 45. Seas come down a little bit, 18 to 20. Gust of 40 in the Lynn Canal, 25 knot winds there in the Stevens Passage region, gust of 35 in Clarence Strait, six foot seas there. And again, the wind's going to continue, but it's just going to change a little bit across the outer coast as we get into Friday. Storm force winds still possible in the region. As we get into Thursday in south central, strong winds inside of Prince William Sound, northwesterlies 40 with nine foot seas, northerlies coming down Cook Inlet. And then storm force winds at least coming through the Barren Islands, 50 to 55, looking at 22 to 23 foot seas, northwesterlies out of Resurrection Bay and westerlies across the northern Gulf. 30 to 50 knot winds will continue across the uh, northern parts of the Gulf. And then a northeasterly wind comes in behind low pressure on Friday. Northeasterlies to 25 inside of Prince William Sound. Five foot seas there. Seven foot seas in the north over some patchy ice. And then northerlies coming down Cook Inlet. 40 knots with 14 to 17 foot seas uh, all the way down to the western barrens. It is going to be a blustery couple days around south central. In southwest, northwesterlies at 25 with nine foot seas. 10 foot seas down the coast with that northerly flow. Westerlies through Shelikoff Strait at 40 with a nine foot sea. 
15, 16, even 19 foot seas there all the way out toward Akiak. Storm force winds possible here in the western Gulf. Not quite as bad south of Sandpoint, but still blustery. 30 knots with a 9 foot sea from the north and east on Thursday. And that comes up to 40 knots and 20 foot seas there as we get into Friday, northeasterly through Shelikoff and east of Kodiak Island. Thankfully, the wind's not quite as strong. 35 knots with 10 to 14 foot seas and 35 to 40 knot winds across the Bering Sea coast with 9 to 17 foot seas from Bristol Bay all the way down the sea coast as we go through Friday across the west. Well, you knew low pressure was out there. A beast of a storm coming back up into the chain. 40 to 50 knot winds there with 17 to 28 foot seas generally south of the chain. 32 foot seas there around Kiska and westward. 45 to 50 knot winds from the east. Not as bad around Unalaska and Nikolsky. As we get into Friday, conditions improve. Still looking at a brutal north and easterly window and it is going to be cold as we get through the next several days. Anywhere from 23 to 26 foot seas in the west. 35 to 40 knot winds just about everywhere else, 20 to 23 in the eastern part of the chain on Friday as well. For the west coast, over the ice in some cases, northerlies in Norton Sound at 15, 25 to 30 knot winds across the west, uh, all the way down to Nunavak Island with five to six foot seas in the open waters. Same goes for St. Paul and St. George. For Friday, winds pick up a little bit more south of Macquarie, all the way out towards Savunga, 30 to 40 knot winds continue, 10 to 17 foot seas in the region. For the north slope, westerlies across the Beaufort over the ice, 15 to 20. Onshore winds across the Chukchi, 15 to 20. Northerlies through the Bering Strait region with five foot seas in the open waters, coming up to nine foot seas there on Friday. Northerlies all the way from Utkiavik southward into Kotzebue Sound, 15 to 25, and then westerlies over Prudhoe Bay and Kaktovik again over some very cold air. Brutal wind chills will continue there. Here's the beast of the storm across the Gulf. Again, winter storm warnings for the Misty Fjords region and areas above Haines. High wind warnings for many parts of southeast tonight. Gusts there could exceed uh, 55 to 65 miles per hour. Winter weather advisory for the western Kenai Peninsula and Turnigan Pass region there due to mainly blowing snow, not a lot of heavy snow. Uh, snow will continue in south central and bitter cold with wind chill warnings for many across the interior and the north slope where values could drop to a feels like index of 65 below in the next couple days. Be extra careful when you're going outside and Merry Christmas to all. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbormaster before you go boating.